right, Shannon, I see your screen and um, you are good to go. So uh, backyard poultry workshop um, and this Can is. Can you hear me OK, Paul? Yes, sir. Uh, right. So here is Mr. Shannon Dietz. Shannon, all yours. Well, thank you very much, Paul. Good morning, everyone. Howdy. Um, as Paul mentioned, my name is Shannon Dietz. I am the Ag and Natural Resources Agent for Texas A&M AgriLife Extension Service based here in Harris County. And I'm excited to join you all this morning uh, to share some information about backyard poultry. Um, we've kind of seen a resurgence in a lot of these topics that we're doing and we're covering here as an agency. Um, um, over the last couple months, obviously, um, due in part to uh, the COVID-19 virus going on, and I'm sure a lot of you, uh, when you were grocery shopping early on when this happened, not only was there uh, a diminishing product of toilet paper and any other kind of products like that, but you also might have seen um, a diminishing um, amount of meat available in the fresh meat section and also eggs. So um, with that being said, we know that there has been some interest in the past about backyard poultry. And now with this happening, this just kind of uh, expanded that and really opened up a lot of opportunities for people. So with that, um, I am gonna present some information to you this morning. We're not gonna get too heavy into it. Um, I'm gonna kind of give you the broad facts that's gonna apply to a lot of people to kind of decide whether you want to move forward with this or not. We do definitely have the opportunity to, uh, to expand on this presentation. Um, part of the survey that Paul will send out is there will be an opportunity for you to list other um, suggestions on topics. So if you want to see a continuation of this particular um, subject matter, you're more than welcome to put that there. Or if you have other particular matters that you would want us to see covered uh, feel free to do that as well. All right. So with that being said, we're going to go ahead and get started with our presentation. And the first question that a lot of people probably ask is um, if you're from the Houston community or if you're in Harris County, I know we have a lot of people that are watching outside of those areas. And I kind of um, saw a couple. Um, I saw somebody type in from Brian this morning. So we do have people outside of the Houston and Harris County area. So keep in mind that this information that I'm going over here is specifically for Harris County. If you are in an outside county, make sure that you check with your, um, your, um, your rules and policies on uh, backyard poultry and livestock and so forth. So um, what's done in Harris County might not necessarily be done in Fort Bend and Waller County and Montgomery and so forth like that. So, but if you want to know if you can raise chickens in Houston, the answer is yes. With the conditions that you have no more than 30 hens with no roosters allowed, and you must be at least 100 feet away from your neighbors, schools, and churches. Um, I like to say that you can always bribe them with free eggs because um, this will, uh, as you see, as you get more into the poultry project, uh, the backyard poultry project, um, unless you have a large family and um, you eat eggs on a daily basis, you probably will end up with extra eggs and so forth. So what we're going to do now is just talk a little bit about chicken terminology and kind of bring you up to speed on some of the, the, the wording that might be out there so that whenever you start talking backyard poultry with um, fellow hobbyists or you go to the store or you start talking about purchasing chicks or chickens or what have you, you might have a better understanding of what's going on there. Uh, so the one bird that we're gonna talk about mostly today is gonna be our layers. And these are hens that are intended for producing eggs mainly. Uh, we also have um, meat breeds. Oh, what happened there? Paul, did I, did I we, lose we, something? Yeah, we lost your screen. It's coming back. Just give it a second. You must have hit something or. I didn't hit, um, but let's see. I apologize about that, y'all. Okay, so meat breeds. Poultry that, poultry that is raised primarily from meat production. All right, that's where we get our broilers and our hens from. That's what you see, your chicken quarters and so forth like that in the meat section. Then we also have dual purpose breeds. The dual purpose breeds are the best of both worlds. You can actually get 
Uh, they're known and they're bred for pr both producing eggs and producing uh, quality or adequate quality meat um, when their, um, their time is up and from producing eggs. Your broody breeds, um, we kind of want to stay away from those when we talk about layers. Uh, these are hens. If you're, if you're in the business of wanting to um, raise your eggs to produce your own chicks, you're going to want to have some broody breeds because these are the ones that um, tend to hatch their own chicks and tend to rest more than layers. They're going to be the ones where you're going to see once they have their eggs, they're going to stay on those particular eggs until they are hatched. Uh, but your layers are, pretend, uh, like I said, just intended for producing eggs. Once they um, lay their eggs, you can go in and uh, pick them up each day and, and they won't um, stay on the nest with those. Free range chickens, um, you know, that's a term that's kind of thrown around a lot lately. You'll see um, organic, you'll see free range, you'll see uh, cage free and different things like that. Basically what that means is um, those chickens are usually found out in the countryside where they're really just confined in a pen and so, so forth. They have a coop, but um, you tend to see a higher price uh, labeled on those and um, you're not really getting any different product from that. All right, Bantam, these are any numerous um, small domestic fowls that are often miniature versions of the standard breeds. If you don't want to um, get involved in raising some of the full breeds, the full size breeds and so forth, that will get up to um, anywhere from five to eight pounds that we're going to discuss a, bit, a little bit about today. The Bantam breeds are going to stay more in the two pound to three pound range. Continuing on with our terminology, a chicken coop, everybody should um, know obviously what that one is. That's a general term used interchangeably with housing or shelter. So we're going to be talking about the importance of a chicken coop later on and some of the uh, factors that need to be included in uh, putting those together. Roosting is very important for chickens. Um, it's a natural instinct. Uh, what we do is, or what chickens do is, usually at night, it would be beneficial in the chicken coop if you had a couple of roosts for the chickens to um, sit and sleep on actually. Um, so these can be anything from um, like a branch or two, um, anything from a wooden dowel rod. Uh, you definitely want to make it um, thick enough that whenever they wrap their claws around it, they're going to have some substance to grab onto. PVC pipes and stuff like that don't, you don't normally work because they're too slippery. So you make sure you want to stick with some type of wood product or stick, or um, you don't even have to buy anything. You can usually find something around uh, your home or in a natural habitat and use that for roost. Bedding, um, this is what's usually scattered over the coop floor. Uh, you always need something to absorb that moisture in the manure. Um, at the same time, it also cushions the bird's feet uh, because it is um, a soft product. It would be just like us walking around with shoes barefooted all the time. This is what chickens have to do. The crop, um, this is an interesting part of the chicken. Um, without getting into detail of the terminology of how you break down, um, chickens store food here temporarily until it goes into the true stomach. So on most hens, you can actually feel the crop. It's located around the breast area. And um, like almost like chipmunks, if you'll see, Chipmunks, um, whenever they hold a lot of food, it goes in the pouches of their cheeks. This is what happens in chickens. Uh, it goes into the crop and then later on, as they drink water and so forth, water is gonna be very important in the chicken's diet. And we'll talk about that a little later on. Water gets involved in there, mixes it up and then pushes it through the stomach. And that's how they um, digest their food. The last terminology that we're gonna talk about today is molting. Um, a lot of people get um, freaked out about this when they, it, but it's actually a natural process of in the fall or winter when the chickens actually shed uh, some of the older feathers and new feathers come in. But also during this time, egg production usually slows down. All right. So next, we're going to talk about um, which came first, the chicken or the egg. And um, so when you decide on putting um, a backyard poultry flock in your backyard. You need, there's, there's, these are the three different areas that you can choose to go from or start from actually. Um, hatching eggs, the baby chicks or the mature birds. So 
you can purchase each one of these, but it really depends on um, how advanced you want to be or how far in the game you want to be. Some people want to start laying eggs right away for consumption. Um, I noticed there was somebody that posted in the Facebook chat or the, the chat here that um, it was a mother and a son and they wanted to do that. So raising chickens from eggs is a great family project. Uh, I would highly encourage it if you have the time to do that. You will need an incubator though as well. Um, so when you're actually hatching eggs, these are fertilized eggs that you would buy already and they will be incubated in about 21 days. Um, but like I said, there is a time process involved in this and you always have to leave it open to problems that might be associated when with your, uh, your incubator, the power could go out or your temperature and your humidity might not be mixed or uh, set at the right temperatures and you might lose more chicks there than what you were planning on starting with. So um, if you do start the incubator route, make sure you read and follow the directions closely. Now, if you start with baby chicks, these are a sure bet that um, they're definitely gonna be cheaper to buy than mature birds. Uh, chicks, if you're looking to bond closely with family members and so forth like that, they tend to do that a lot easier in this stage. They kind of look to you as their mom. So they will have that bonding process. Uh, chicks, when you buy them from the stores, um, they're going to come with two options. You can have the unsexed, uh, also called the straight run, or they are mixed in gender as they hatch. And usually these are about 50-50 on cockerels and pullets. And so the cockerels are the males and the pullets are the females. And remember, if you're in the Houston area, you really don't want the cockerels in your flock because you're gonna have to call those. So you're really just gonna go for the pullet route and you're gonna pay a little bit more for that. Sex chicks are sorted so that you get exactly uh, as many pullets and cockerels that you want. We talked about that. Sex chicks usually cost the most and um, cockerels are going to have the least value because, like I said, they're going to have to be called and so forth. A lot of people need to realize, too, that um, or they're under the misunderstanding that you need roosters to have chickens produce eggs, your, your layers to produce eggs. That is not correct. Um, your pullets, your hens, your chickens will produce eggs. It's a natural instinct for them. Um, the only time you would need a rooster is as if you were fertilizing the eggs. So it would just be uh, the same as in any other um, uh, animal species and so forth like that. The male would need to be present, but the female is always going to produce the eggs. All right. So uh, feel f feel good that you knowing that um, just buying the hens itself will um, still be able to produce eggs. The two advantages of starting with mature birds is you won't spend much time feeding uh, unproductive birds since they will be laying very soon. And because the birds are, will be just coming into late and you'll have them for the uh, longest productive life. Now, uh, my good friends over at uh, Wabash Feed Store here in Houston, they're located on 4537 North Shepherd Drive. I went over and visited with John the other day and they do have uh, both baby chicks in stock and they also have mature birds. Now, uh, we talked about the price difference. You can get them sexed or you can get them uh, unsexed there as well. Um, the, the price for your full grown layers ready to take home, uh, which will produce eggs in a couple of weeks are running about $20 a hen. And your chickens, uh, your baby chicks are running anywhere around uh, three to $4. I will let you know with the high demand of chickens right now, they do run out a lot of times during the week and um, the availability on different species or different breeds of chickens are gonna be limited. So um, you're more than welcome to go over there and talk to them a little bit more. Um, it takes um, about five months for uh, 20 weeks, four to five months, about 20 weeks for um, a chick to turn into a mature chicken, all right? How many hens for your flock, all right? Um, this is something that um, a lot of people get carried away with, especially 
what you're going to have to do is take um, a lot into consideration is how much room you actually have in your backyard or where you're going to actually be putting your flock. Some of you outside of the Houston area might have large pasture space and you can afford and you have that space to put out more uh, more chickens and so forth like that. Whereas somebody living in a particular subdivision um, is maybe uh, allocated a very small space and you might need only like four or five chickens. So um, one thing not to get carried away is usually everybody sees the little baby chicks and they were like, oh, you know, they're so cute and the kids are with you. And they're like, every, every, all the kids are gonna get like two to three chickens to raise and everything. Well, it's just like a small puppy. That small chicken, the small chick is gonna turn into a large bird and it's gonna eat a lot more feed. It's gonna need a lot more care. It's gonna need a lot more attention and so forth like that. So the three golden rules that we like to promote are keep no more chickens than you have space for. Um, keep no more chickens than you have time for because um, a lot of people need to assume or don't assume that once you put the chickens out there, you're not gonna have to worry about doing anything with them. Um, and other than just go check eggs and so forth. There is some time involved in this in a proper and productive project. And you want to keep no more chickens than you can afford to maintain. It is not one of it's not one of the most expensive projects that you can get involved in, but there is some cost involved in it. We're going to talk about that as well. Um, so the basic goals of your project, you need to decide early on whenever you're planning, um, you you. It would be best if you make a plan. Um, are you going to use breeds primarily for egg production? Is that what you're looking for? Or are you going to want breeds used from uh, meat production? Because that's going to determine what breeds you're going to choose and go for. Um, or you just want some people, if you're out in the country, you want pretty um, exhibition birds, what they call with the long flowing tails and the nice, bright, shiny feathers and so forth like that. So those are always fun to have in the flock as well. So next we're gonna go over a couple um, popular backyard chicken breeds. Again, these are just a couple that I wanna give you some examples of. There are hundreds more out there. These are just some of them that are known to um, rise above the rest and they're usually more docile than most chickens and so forth. And they're all really good. We're talking mostly about layers today for egg production. So these are gonna be usually higher on the egg production count than most of the other ones. Okay, the first Shannon, one we're talk about, yes. Shannon, hold on just a second. Let before you get into that, let I've got a couple questions I've oh, sure. that, that popped up here. So let me get through these. Uh, all right. Uh, they asked about the name of the place. Uh, it's Wabash. Uh, here's right. one question. What do you mean when you say the male sex chick will have to be, and I believe you're saying cold, cold C U L L E D? Yes. yes. Um, so just like uh, so. Cold is um, the politically correct term of actually uh, getting rid of it. Um, you don't want that. So if you're calling an animal, you're actually taking out of your herd. So you would have to either kill that bird or you would have to dispose of it in some kind of way. So that's what calling means. Okay. Or they could give it to someone that wants a male and if, they yeah, throw it on. Yeah, outside of the Houston area, yeah, because uh, we yeah. couldn't allow roosters here. So if you do happen to have that, yes, you can always pass it off on somebody else. Okay. Uh, another quick one here is how many chickens for a family of seven? You know, that one's kind of hard to answer because it really depends on the egg consumption of that family. Um, so if it's a family of seven that eats um, eggs every day, um, so one chicken is going to provide about an egg a day. All right. So if you have five chickens, what I normally like for people with backyard poultry projects here in Houston, I would recommend four to five chickens in their backyard uh, for a, a good number to start off with a flock. That's going to give you about five eggs a day. So over um, a week's time, you're looking at what, about 30, 35 eggs or so forth there. Um, so that's really dependent on the consumption um, and and so forth like that. So that one's kind of hard to answer. OK, and I think that would be there's a similar question. How many chickens on four acres? It, it really just depends on how many eggs you want to produce and Correct. how much right. you can handle. And how much of that four acres you want to dedicate to your flock. Um, so there's ways um, 
that you can actually do um, rotation of your chickens on a four acres if you have that much land, um, as opposed to somebody with a smaller plot, um, you can do that. Um, but keep in mind, the more chickens that you have, the more investment you're going to be putting into that. So if that's not an issue, um, you can raise anywhere upwards of, you know, 20 to 30, you know, chickens on a four acre plot. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think that covers it. We're up to speed. So uh, you can proceed. Okay. So yeah, the Rhode Island red hens, um, those are one of the most popular breeds that you see usually in, in pictures of chickens and so forth. Usually the mature weight on a, a Rhode Island red is going to run about six and a half pounds at mature weight. Uh, they lay dark brown eggs and they're listed as a dual purpose breed. Uh, but mostly used as laying hens. They have dark red feathers in color that give them their name, um, and they do well in small flocks. The next one is the Wyandotte, um, and this is a pretty breed. Um, this one, as you can see in the picture, they come in several different shades, uh, several different colors. Uh, again, they will also weigh about six and, a half, six and a half pounds at mature weight and produce brown eggs and they are listed as a dual purpose breed also. And the ones that I'm talking to you about today, these are pretty um, common breeds. Uh, they're usually found at most feed stores uh, through uh, mature hens or as in chicks as well. The next one is the Americana. Um, this one is a little bit smaller. Um, it's gonna run um more on the, about the four pound size four and a half pound size and this one's kind of a fun breed because the tint of the eggshell is going to be like a light green in color so um you can do that with some of your breeds especially if you uh if, if it's a family project and you want to experiment with some colors of eggshells that are different than the normal white or brown uh there are some that have shades of blue uh, some that are, have shades of um, green, like I said, like the Americana, or you'll have some that different have different shades of brown. You'll go from dark brown to light brown and so forth. And not sure if anybody knows what determines the color of the chick of uh, the eggshell. Um, I'll kind of leave that open as an open-ended question, and we'll see if anybody guesses the answer. What is the, um, so the question is, what on a chicken determines the color of the egg shell produced? And we'll leave that and we'll see who gets the answer correct um, at the end of the presentation. I'll just kind of leave that out there. All right, and the last one we're gonna talk about this morning is the Arpington. Arpington definitely is one of the heavier breeds out there. This one will get around eight pounds at mature weight. You can see the picture on the left. Uh, those are some pretty hefty girls. Um, not a lot of that is not, I mean, a lot of that is feathers, but a lot of that is meat as well. Uh, and they are listed as a dual purpose breed. So you're looking at the end of production on those. If you would choose to use it as a meat bird, um, as a pretty, uh, large size, uh, brawler that you could cook, uh, for your family and so forth. All right. So a lot of people are always wondering about like the cost involved in starting a backyard flock. Um, and again, this is going to really determine or depend on where you're at and how extravagant you want to go with it. So keep in mind, this is just a general, um, uh, a general budget here. What this is, is based on a uh, three-year lifespan of chickens. And we, we're basing this off of, you will see, um, let me see how, uh, well, um, we're basing this off of four birds and um, four birds at 250 a piece. Uh, these numbers are very generic. You might be able to go to some feed stores and find some more expensive. Uh, some of your more expensive breeds are going to be higher and so forth like that. The dozen of eggs produced, that's going to be 179 um, eggs or yeah, produced in a dozen in over a three year span. All right. So you're going to get a lot of eggs from four to five chickens if you follow the guidelines set you know if if you if you have the correct housing if you feed them the right rations the formula and you keep them away from predators and you feed them the right feed this is this is what the benefit is going to be um, you can see that chick starter feed a 50 pound bag 
you would need to purchase one of those, usually about $16 uh, early bird grower, another 50 pound bag. One of those run you about 50. And then um, the majority of your feed cost is going to come from your layer feed. Uh, you would need to buy over a three year span, about 18 bags of that running you roughly around 250 to 300 dollars. One of the lines that I didn't go over was the housing. You can see an example there of anything from 200 to 1200 dollars. And I have that variation there because um, there are a lot of specialty builders now in Houston um, who will actually come out to your web, your home site now and build a coop uh, to your specs. Um, there are a lot of books out there with plans for coops in them. Or you can actually build your own coop. It doesn't, um, oh, somebody else took control. Um, Paul. Paul? Yes, you, you should. Um, it said somebody else took control. Oh, geez. OK. So. Um, getting back to that, I apologize. Um, so you can go for as extravagant as you want on a chicken coop or you can um, be uh, very minimal. Um, all it takes is a couple sheets of plywood, some two by fours, some chicken wire. There are plenty of YouTube videos out there that can give you step-by-step -step directions of them. Um, it's just how much you want to go and put in this in this investment. All right. So next, we're going to talk about feed for your hens. Um, feed represents about seventy percent of the cost of raising chickens, and we could see that from the budget slide just before that. Keep in mind, as a small producer. Feed costs are going to usually run you higher than a large scale producer, uh, but chickens must be fed an adequate diet um, for maximum productivity. And we talked about that in the steps of the chickens are going to be uh, are going to give you the best quality eggs and the best quality meat only if you um, do the right projects to maintain that. All right. Age and function of your flock is going to determine the specific um, nutrient requirements. Um, these are a lot, these most times are met by mixing. Uh, so I don't understand why. And maybe you can request people not to take control. Yeah, Paul, um, do we have that availability? Well, it's it comes up on mine. Uh, people shouldn't be able to take control on it. I, I've got it where I can click take control, but um, other I'll folks everybody. shouldn't be able to do that. OK, so do I. I'm just a participant and I can take control, so okay. that should not be uh, that should not be the case. I'm just feedback. All right. You, Continue and I'll just I'll see okay. if I can. Uh... All right. I apologize, everybody. So uh, we're going to try and get back on track here. Um, but what you want to do, the main the main purpose of this slide here is. Depending on where you're at in your flock, if you're starting with chickens or if you're starting with. Um, chicks or, or what have you or finishers or layers, you never want to feed the incorrect ratio or. Um, feed to those particular feed uh, particular birds. What it'll do, it'll cause uh, bone disformation, it'll cause kidney shutdown, and it'll cause sometimes death in some of the chickens. So you wanna make sure that if you're starting with chicks, you make sure that you get a chick ration. If you're working with layers um, and they're, they're in the full stage of layer production, you wanna make sure that you're feeding them layer uh, rationed feeds and so forth. So you don't want to, even though you might see a bag of feed that might be cheaper and you're you're wanting it, well, let me just kind of feed them this one right now for a week or something, and then we'll switch back to the other one. They really need to be um, fed.
fed what they're at in their production cycle of their life. All right. So if I don't stress anything, there'll be two things that we stressed about real quick is uh, water and um, heat stress. And we're going to go through this real quick because I'm kind of running out of time. I apologize. But water is going to be very, very important to your hens production. Um, things that are going to be determining for the amount of water that chickens are going to get is going to be the age. If chickens drink Chickens will drink more water as they get older. They are going to drink more water if they are laying, if they're in the laying production cycle. Um, the temperature, if the temperature rises, if the humidity rises, obviously they're going to drink more water during this time as well. And then the time of the day, chickens drink the most at dawn and dusk. So um, you're going to want to be aware of that um, going into this as well. Water quality. Um, this is something you might want to pay attention to if you're seeing that you have fresh water out on a daily basis and you're cleaning the water trough, trough and you're cleaning the water bowls, but the chickens still aren't drinking. Uh, there could be an issue associated with the color of the water. There could be something associated with uh, a particular odor that don't they don't care for the opacity of the water if the water is not clear. Uh, you really don't want your hens being able to drink from like puddles out in the yard or anything like that. Uh, dirty water, that's not going to be good for them. You definitely want to make sure that you have some type of fresh water system that they can partake in. And then the last one, you're going to want to have it free of bacteria. Um, and if you have any issues with any of your water that you see the chickens aren't um, drinking from it on a regular basis you can have your water tested um, and if you have high concentrations of minerals in it uh, you might have to look at some type of other water source and so forth but you always want to uh, one rule that i say is you never expect your chickens to drink water that you would not drink yourself all right so the last couple slides we're going to be wrapping up here with um is biosecurity and disease management. We're not going to go into this too much, but some of the main points that you should take care of this is um, you're also you're always going to want to purchase healthy stock. Go with a reputable um, grower where you get your chicks from. If you if you um, say for example like Wabash feed Wabash feed store, if if you develop a relationship with that feed store or any feed store in your particular county they're going to be very knowledgeable in those products um, such as chicks or hens or your feed and so forth. And you can count on them as well as your county agent in your county to get answers from. You're gonna wanna keep your birds confined using pasture coops or fencing. Uh, keep your dirty equipment away from your flock. You do not usually wanna mix birds in general. Um, you, if you're introducing birds to the flock, new birds, you wanna keep them in quarantine for at least three weeks. Uh, before you introduce them there to make sure that they don't show any signs of disease or stress or anything that they can introduce to your healthy flock. You're also going to want to control the rodents, uh, not only because they will tend to get in there and get your eggs, but they also carry disease and other um, pests that will easily be transferred to your chickens as well. Keep your buildings in good repair. Uh, wear dedicated clothing and footwear when working around the birds. Uh, a lot of you probably have heard of the avian flu or uh, in the past and so forth. So especially a lot of people don't realize whenever you're walking in a chicken coop, um, the chicken manure on the bottom of the ground, on the bottom of the coop is what you're stepping in. You definitely don't want to bring that into your house and so forth. Make sure you have a dedicated pair of rubber boots or, or shoes or something that you work, uh, work with. Uh, so that you can leave them specifically for that project. And you always want to wash your hands before and after handling birds. Sanitation coops should be cleaned at least once a week. Uh, feeders and water should be regularly cleaned and disinfected. Most times you can mix a couple drops of Clorox with a gallon of water uh, because like most water uh, in the South, or in high temperatures, there will be some type of algae buildup and so forth. So that Clorox and that washing will keep that down and it would be uh, more uh, tempting for the, for the birds to drink out of with that. All right, dust baths should be available for your gals. Um, dust baths are very beneficial. Um, you 
definitely want to encourage them because if you've ever seen chick or uh, chicks or, or hens or pullets or whatever flying around in their dust bath, uh, what this does is kind of alleviate them of lice and sheds um, dry skin off of them and everything. So dust baths are very beneficial. All right. Predators, we're going to wrap this up by talking about most active, most are active at night or early morning. Um, threats come from land and air. And you also want to keep the protected, um, your chickens protected at night. Um, this is usually whenever most predators are on the prowl. And like I said, we can't forget about the air predators. Um, hawks and owls are just as dangerous as foxes and coyotes and possums and raccoons on the ground. So um, the threats can come from both land and air. Last thing we're going to talk about is preventing heat stress in poultry. And a lot of times people, um, when they're raising chickens, they're either going to be worried about their chickens getting too cold in the winter or too hot in the summer. Definitely, if you're from Houston or if you're from the South, you know that we have to worry about heat related stress uh, more for ourselves and our animals than we do with the cold. So um, chickens can get heat stroke just as well as animals. So um, that's all relative to temperature and humidity. Um, the first signs of heat stress is you will see panting uh, from your chickens and increased water intake, and this will result in death if not uh, seen about on a very quick basis. Um, they will always, always, always need access to cool, fresh water and ventilation. Ventilation is going to be key in your coop, all right? Um, so can you imagine if you had a chicken coop and you didn't have any um, ventilation, any windows in it, if you didn't have any space that had uh, like wire covering um, during the summer, if it was exposed to full sun uh, with no tree or shade cover or anything, it can actually, your coop can actually turn into an oven. I mean, the inside temperature on that can get extremely, extremely hot. So you definitely want to have some type of portable fan. You want to have window access, um, something that you can close at night but you can uh, keep open during the day and so forth. And if you have further questions about this, I will be glad to answer them on a one-on-one -on -one, uh, after this presentation is over. So keeping your birds cool um, is uh, one of the last slides and we're gonna be wrapping up here. Um, in most cases, uh, you can manage this by um, allowing, like I said, the ventilation in your coop and so forth. Um, that should be your first priority. Feeding, feeding schedules, um, on most feeding schedules, your chickens are going to eat early in the morning and they're going to fill up during the day. And then that's going to provide more heat and more stress to them. If you can adjust their feeding schedule where they don't eat as much in the morning. So you have a limited feed time in the morning and the majority of your feed time in the evening and they're not being exposed to that heat stress during the afternoon heat time, that will be a lot better than just letting them eat all in the morning. Again, managing water. If I can't stress one issue enough is fresh, clean water for your chickens at all time. And this is probably gonna, gonna take the majority of time using that um, or, or your time dedicated to your chickens. And chickens, you can also provide electrolytes in the water, just like humans. Uh, they sweat, they lose sodium, they lose magnesium, they lose a lot of electrolytes, a lot of minerals and so forth like that. So you can add electrolytes to the water about three times a week. And this should be done early in the morning before they uh, actually go into heat stress. You don't want to do it every day, but you're more than welcome to do it. And you can do it on a couple mornings to keep those electrolytes up in your chickens. Okay, guys, um, you can see my resources page there. I did go a little over time. We had a lot of information this morning. I apologize. Um, I'm open to questions now. I'm also open to um, if somebody, if Paul or Brandy yeah. um, yeah. wants to type in my contact information or my email address, you're more than welcome to do that. Um, Okay, Shannon. Uh, I've I've got some questions for you. So okay. We'll, we'll we'll go through these, and if if folks have to drop off, that's fine. If they want to stay on, that's great. So first one, and this I went I worked my way back up. Sure. Um, can you have a mix of hens and chicks together? So if you have your flock, and um, you have at different I ages. I would not. 
um, you really need to focus on one particular stage at a time. Um, so I would either just have the chicks that you're raising up, but um, if you're in an area that you're trying to, obviously you're raising your own chicks, you're gonna have hens and chicks at the same time. But if, you're, if your primary goal is just egg production, um, you usually just wanna stick with that particular at, at that time. Okay. Um, we had a lot of answers for your question on the color of the eggshell. We have oh, okay. earlobes, waddles, legs. Earlobes. Earlobes is correct. Earlobes is the cor correct. All right. I'm a plant guy. I did not know that chickens had earlobes. So <laughs> I, I know, learned right? something today. Yeah. Exactly. Um, how long do chickens lay eggs before you have to use them as meat? So what is there for so layers? Can, I mean, yeah, again, this is going to be a timing factor, but usually um, three years is going to be peak and is going to kind of die off a little bit after that. But there has been some breeds that will go for at least five years. It's really going to depend on if you really if the breed you get is a really uh, productive layer. Um, so some are going to be um, longer production and that's going to be a quality that you're going to want to research beforehand. Uh, if you're going to get something that's going to go that three or four year span, or if you want something that's going to be on a shorter time span, um, you're just going to have to keep that in mind. Okay. Um, when you talked about the breeds, um, do you can do you recommend just a single species, uh, yes. or can you have a mix? You can have a mix. If if you have a mix, that's going to be more for your outside operations, like in a pasture setting and so forth. But if you're going to be in a backyard setting uh, with a much smaller coop and everything, I would suggest we're just going one breed. OK, um, here's a question, maybe a little bit off, but it, somebody qu asked about uh, A&M developed a quail species or a, a variety. Uh, are these available to the public? Are you aware of anything with regard to quail? Uh, that I am not. OK, no uh, problem. Um, can you feed millet to baby chicks as a feed, um, as a food source? I wouldn't, um, I would wait till they're older for that. Um, on the chicks, they need a very specific, um, diet. Okay. Um, yes, we are recording this, so this will be, uh, available for folks to see. Okay. Uh, hold on. I... I feed my chicken feed scraps from home. What can f what can I feed them without hurting the diet? Um, so some chicken scraps are fine, uh, like a lot of your leafy things, uh, especially during the summer. Uh, chickens love watermelon. They love all kinds of watermelons. They love any type of fruit. If you're looking to keep them hydrated during the summer, uh, any type of fruit that has a high water uh, amount in it, like cucumbers, uh, cantaloupes, musk melons, watermelons, uh, tomatoes, anything like that uh, are all going to be fine. Um, there are certain plant species that you're going to want to stay away from um, that are poisonous to chickens and everything. But most table scraps, if it's from like the vegetable section, you should be fine with. OK, uh, I think you may have answered this one. How long do chickens live? Yeah, again, that one's going to be de very dependent, um, but on average, three to five years. OK, and then uh, the follow up on that was, can chickens survive our summer heat? And it sounds like it is yes, as long as you provide them with enough water and Correct. you manage them properly. OK, Correct. how about um, if you collect rainwater, can you use rainwater as your water source? You can use rainwater as a water source, um, but again, it's going to be up to your girls to to tell you whether they like it or not. Okay. Um, so again, if if they drink it, you're more than welcome to use it, yes. All right. Um, are backyard flocks ever registered with the USDA? Uh, that The question is, what are your thoughts on registering backyard flocks with the USDA? Uh, I would not. There's no would reason you would right. need to register your flock with USDA, no. OK, can the coop be freestanding under the Houston sun? What is the most common disease and what is the first sign that uh, you have the symptoms and it requires yep. care? So freestanding in the Houston sun. Um, yes, you can. Again, uh, as long as you provide adequate ventilation, you um, some people install um, fans in them. 
Um, if you have electricity that can be run to the coop, uh, the fan should be about bird level height. Um, and then um, you're always going to want to have that draft air in there. All right. During the day, you're going to want to have the windows open. Uh, if you if you happen to have a shade tree in your backyard, uh, that would be something you would take advantage of. Uh, other people have been known to put some type of canopy over their chicken coop to kind of cut down on the heat, um, bearing down on it and so forth. Um, so those are all good factors there. As far as diseases, um, there are several diseases that can affect the chickens. What I suggest there is um, be aware of what your flock looks like. Uh, they should always be bright eyed. Uh, they should be very energetic. They should always be scratching the ground. If you see chickens that aren't drinking anymore or, eat, or aren't eating anymore or kind of tend to stay away from the rest of the flock, those are little signs like that that are going to tell you that there's something wrong with some of your girls and so forth. So if you see that, um, there are too many diseases to go and affect here, but just need to be aware of what your flock looks like on a daily basis. And if you have any issues that come up and like that, make sure that you bring them to a vet and they can prescribe um, the right. Uh, antibiotic if need to be. Uh, okay. Uh, what do you suggest for a dust bath? So a dust bath, they're going to kind of create on their own. Um, more than likely, it's going to be a little shallow hole, uh, a bowl in the ground that they're going to kind of scratch on, uh, and they're going to eventually get about like one to two inches deep. And what they're going to do is they're just going to get in there and just fly around and fly around. You might be looking out your back window and you see like this big tornado of dust flying around. That's the chickens using the dust bath. So it's nothing that you have to prepare for itself. They usually make their own. Okay, I think you answered this one, but there's several here again about mixing and matching different breeds. It, um, yeah, I would stay and, away from that. Right, okay. And then the next, uh, here's another one, which I thought was interesting is, um, what is the best breed around kids? Are, are some of them temperamental? Or yeah, yeah, it, like that Americana one that we talked about earlier. Um, they have a very docile breed. They're very easy to handle. Um, they they won't get aggressive or anything like that with people uh, handling them. So there are definitely some that are bred to be more docile than the other. And that one was one of them that we highlighted today, that Americana one. OK, great. Um, in, in some of the plans for coops, um, is there say a, a certain square footage that you want for per chicken? Yeah, yeah. Um, we try and stay with the rule of about six square feet uh, per chicken. Okay, so the question is how large of a coop for four hens? So you're looking at at least 24 square feet. Correct. Okay, great. Uh, let's see, we're coming to the end here. Uh, here's a question, how do you kill a chicken? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, um, so, yeah, <laughs> that, I wasn't expecting that one. Um, so a, a chicken is, um, you would have to, uh, you would have to dehead the chicken, obviously. Um, you can either break the chicken's neck um, and um, depends on how humanely you want to do it. Now, there are several places in Houston um, that I know of that if you bring your live birds to, they will actually um, produce them for you. Like they will clean them um, and they will defeather them and uh, cut them up if you like and so forth like that. So you don't have to do the process yourself. But if you are uh, interested in actually butchering your birds, I can get you some more information on that. Okay. If, if uh, in my case, if I was a first timer, what would be the easiest breed to work with or to grow? Um, your Rhode Island Reds, probably. Okay. Um, those kind of jump out in the crowd. Those those are the most recognized for uh, high egg production. Um, and again, um, a dual purpose breed where if you choose to use them as a meat bird at the end of their cycle, you can do that. Um, and, and pretty temperamental, uh, pretty, you know, intolerant. All right. Uh, is it OK for chickens to uh, have access to food at all times? Or, do you, um, or you recommend going out and feeding at yeah because I know you mentioned you some type one. of feeding cycle. Okay. There's even some um, there's even some feed troughs out there where like with the water troughs there's like water nipples 
um, like on a five gallon bucket. And I should have had a picture of it, but it's, it's pretty easy to explain. Uh, say for example, on a water bucket, if you had a five gallon water bucket hanging, you can buy these water nipples and drill them in around the outside of the five gallon bucket around the bottom. And the chickens will actually go up and peck on the water nipple and that's how they'll get their water. All right. So that's opposed to uh, the, the little water bowl on the ground that you would get a lot of dirt and feed and everything in. So the same concept works. Um, chickens are pretty easy to train. Um, so keep that in mind. So if you put up some type of feed station, there are some where they'll go and click on it and the feed will come down the trough and it will release feed at the same time. So if you're not wanting to go out there and feed like three times a day or whatever, there are uh, mechanisms that can be purchased or if you're mechanically inclined, um, there's a ton of resources out on YouTube that people have done uh, where they have the, um, the feed trough on that or the feed container on the outside and it runs to the feed container on the inside. And when chickens are ready to, to feed, they will go and um, lift like the little um, lid containing and they'll get the amount of feed off of it that they want. And then they'll go on their their way after that. OK, uh, next question is uh, best place for design and sizing of the coops. I'm assuming some of the links that you had at the end of your yeah, presentation yeah, would yeah. have that information. Yeah. OK, and, um, the feed store that I mentioned earlier, Wabash actually has um, uh, a book on on chicken um, coops and there's free. There's plenty of free um, designs out on the Web to just Google chicken coops. Um, plenty of stuff out there okay um how about the uh if you've got a yard that's pretty much all grass um how, how do you develop an area where they can go and scratch and, and yeah. maybe that's where you maybe pull so, up some of the lawn or no, no they're gonna do no. it naturally so okay. and that's a that's a good point because if you have if you're in the city of houston and you and you're very proud of your manicured yard and you have beautiful green grass and so forth. Once you introduce chickens there, that particular spot that you're going to have that coop in, you need to be aware of that that grass is going to start to die off. You're going to have some dead patches in it uh, because the chickens will, they're just natural scavengers. They're going to go out and they're going to start scratching and they're going to start looking for insects and different things like that. So that area that you have pinned off for your chicken coop um, is going to be affected uh, by not looking like the rest of your yard at that point. So you need to be aware of that, that that is one of the, um, um, the factors that you're gonna have to give up if you want to raise chickens in your backyard. Okay. But you don't I, have to do anything on your own. They actually do it and they'll, they- They'll find their own yeah. spot. Okay. Yeah. Um, I actually skipped one here. Will chickens attack my veggie garden? Um, I I can toss in my two cents. Uh, we had uh, we have gardens. We work with the the youth uh, with Harris County Juvenile Probation, and they had chickens. And we yes, we had to put up some fencing around the vegetable gardens because they would get in. They would go after the seed, yeah, uh, and then they would definitely peck at the vegetables. So. Uh, if you've got veggies, you're going to want to put up some sort of barrier to keep them out of it. Or even if you have vegetable gardens, um, they they Paul, they can kind of be like a beneficial, um, you know, animal yes. because they will go in. But you just have to be very controlled with them. So yes. I wouldn't let them in for like hours on hours. They'll definitely turn your garden in. But if you were to let them in for like about 45 minutes to an hour at a time and you're and you have the time to kind of dedicate that watch that they don't do that. You definitely want to don't want to put them in the stage where your seeds are just being put down. You're going to want to go with more mature plants and everything. But if you did it on a controlled basis, that would cut out some of your pesticides and so forth. Yeah, yeah, yeah they, they will. They will. They will feed on the bad insects. So that that is a plus. Um, how long should you keep them cooped up before letting them roam during the day? Um, so they can get out. Um, a lot of times they have their own little trap doors uh, where they can kind of go in and out freely. Um, I wouldn't I wouldn't put any type of coop where you actually had to go out there and physically release them each day and night because um, that's going to get to be um, a time consuming part on you that you're not going to want to do that. So a lot of times you have like a trap door 
or like a, a doggy door adaptation or something like that, where they can kind of freely come and go, um, is what you're going to want to install there. Okay. Uh, they were talking about uh, some chickens for meat at the end of the cycle, and I believe you said that's three to five years, correct? Yes. Okay. Um, link to how to install a barrier to put around the coop to keep predators away. Uh, would that also be uh, in some of the links that you had at the end of the presentation? Yeah, yeah. You, um, some people use electric fences and, uh, and so forth like that. You just have to make sure that chickens are going to be very sneaky. If, they're gonna, if there's going to be a hole that they can get out of when they're supposed to be confined to the coop, they will get out. And as well as a predator will find that to get in. So you have to make, um, you know, every other day you have to kind of make an inspection of of your of your coop and everything, make sure everything's secure and so forth. Okay. Um, here's a question, and 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 I'll put in my two cents. I I think so. Uh, this person is posting. Sorry, confused now. Earlier, I thought you mentioned yeah. you shouldn't feed them in the morning. So I believe you said you can feed them. You don't want them to intake all of their food. Correct. In the morning because and that's only problems. during that time of the hot summer months and so forth. Right. That okay. time where that heat stress is going to be a factor when you start getting into July, July, August, September ish kind of type thing. Um, but yes, correct, Paul. Okay. Uh, and I think we answered that. So let's see. We are almost there, Shannon. Hang in there. Um, oh, I'm good. What? What's uh, a trapdoor with? The, all right. What? What's the best way to protect from predators in your backyard? Um, I'm assuming it's going to be the depends on the type of coop, correct? Yeah, yeah. Um, if if you live near a tree line or something like that, um, you're not going to, if you're in the city limits of Houston or Harris County or anything, the most predators that you might have would be, um, or going to, that you might be exposed to are coons, raccoons, and um, uh, possums. Um, so, if you, if you have, obviously you're going to have, want to have um, a fence around your yard. So I think most places in Houston are going to have some type of backyard fence. If you don't have a fence, uh, you might want to consider that and having your coop inside of it, because that's going to add an extra barrier. If you just have that one coop area that has the, the, the fence around it, um, you're kind of opening up a little bit more. I guess, um, uh, enticement to some more animals getting in there. Uh, you're also definitely going to not want to let um, a lot of feed stay on the ground or anything to attract other animals and so forth. That's why it's beneficial and it's very strongly encouraged that you clean the floor uh, pretty often a couple of times during the week and so forth, um, because a lot of those things are going to attract not only your chickens, but other predators as well. Okay, and I think the last one I'm seeing here is you mentioned a trap door in the coop for them to come in and out. Yeah. Um, will predators also use that to try and get into the coop? They will, but there are certain factors that you can do that are going to keep keep those out. Like if you have that installed outside fence, um, that'll work. Um you know, if, if something wants to get in there, the it's majority gonna get of, in. yeah, it's going to get in there. Um, I saw somebody mentioned something about chicken snakes, um, chicken snakes. I hate chicken snakes. I hate snakes in general, but it's almost impossible to kind of uh, keep those out because snakes, I mean, um, they they can actually get through the wire and different things like that. But if you're in an area, a lot of times you're going to have your chicken snakes and your foxes and you and, um, you know, your hawks and everything on the outside in the more rural areas. Um, you're not going to find so much of those in, in the city areas and in the incorporated areas. Um, if you want more information on that, I can definitely send you some, um, some information. They can contact me through my email um, and I can send them some more information on those particular links. All right. Well, I think that covers it. So uh, first of all, uh, oh, we got one more last one here. Last one for the day. How many hours of the day do chickens like to roam freely? Yeah. Uh, so they need a certain amount of sunlight in order to, to produce their eggs. And 
we we call for about usually about eight to 12 hours of sunlight um, during the winter months. Um, they still need that light to produce eggs and so forth. So if by it, you can do that by simply installing a regular size light bulb in the chicken coop, and that is sufficient providing enough light and you can set it on a timer. Um, and so when the days start getting shorter in the winter months, that light will um, still help trigger that egg production, but they usually need on general eight to 12 hours of sunlight a day. Okay. And with that, we are going to bring this to a uh, close. Uh, if you do have any other questions, uh, Shannon's email was posted on the in the chat area. Uh, I do want to thank you all for joining us. I hope you enjoyed this topic. Uh, we do have spots open for next week's topic, which will be gardening in small uh, spaces. Uh, so until then, uh, I'd like to thank you again and uh, have a great week. Thanks, Shannon. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, everybody, for attending. Thanks, Shannon. Hey, Kim. Thank you.